Less than 150 subs to go until I hit 5,000 subs. Will you do your part? I sure hope so. Today is a long overdue video for you guys. I've been off for about a week, but I am back. Wanted to give you guys a review of a book I just read called Halo the Rubicon Protocol. This came out about a week ago. It is written by Kelly Gay. And um, it was supposed to come out earlier in the year and then it was delayed and delayed again. That's important to a little bit of my review towards the end of the book on some of the delays and some of the concerns I had with the overall structure. But I'll ultimately say I think the book was good. And it's definitely worth investing time in if you're a Halo super fan like me. And if you were curious as to get a little bit more information about what the heck is going on with Zeta Halo. Now this is a prequel book. This takes place immediately after the UNSC Infinity comes out of warp over the surface of Zeta Halo and everything that happens in the days before the Master Chief wakes up from stasis, which begins the Halo Infinite campaign. You're gonna be introduced to a lot of characters here. And if you know anything about how Halo Infinite was at least structured initially, you know that the UNSC did put up a decent fight, the best they could, on Zeta Halo, but that the Banished, under Atriox's rule and under some of their militaristic authority, were just a little bit too much to handle for those UNSC survivors, and a lot of them are dead or scattered. This book does not, unfortunately, push the story or the narrative further than anything we have already seen. So we don't know what happened after the end of Halo Infinite in the literature world or in the video game world. It appears to me that 343 is gonna be saving that for some DLC, which I think we're gonna be getting some point in early 2023. So if you're a lore enthusiast, as I am, and you wanna know more of the story, what is going on, uh, unfortunately, this book is not gonna answer that. What this book will do is it will set a lot of narrative tone for things you already experienced in Halo Infinite. You will grow to hate the Banished even more than you already do. There are some really cool Spartan heroes that have hidden audio logs scattered throughout the gameplay of Halo Infinite. You'll learn more about them. You'll learn more about some of the NPCs that you encounter in the Halo Infinite main story. And you'll get an overall sense of what life was like for the early survivors who ejected out of the Infinity. Now, unlike other Halo books, this book was a very, very somber tone. And this reminded me a lot of Reach in the sense that you already knew essentially what was going to happen to a lot of these characters before you began reading the book. Um, it made it a little harder to read in that sense because you want to get invested in them and you want to know their story, but you ultimately know a lot of their fates. This did not, though, thankfully, handcuff what happened in those early days. And it, I think Kelly, D Kelly Gay did a really good job of making the story unique and interesting and adding nice layers of lore on top of things that we already knew in a really meaningful way. A lot of places you visit in Halo Infinite were actually former UNSC strongholds in the form of bases or ships or um, you know some kind of like settlement like that that you get to see them being crafted and fought for and then ultimately lost, renamed something else in Infinite. So there's places you're going to have experienced in Halo Infinite that you're like, oh, I know what this originally was. And in just the little bit I spent going back into Infinite after completing this book in the campaign and walking around in some of these places, I can absolutely see where she did a very good job of kind of weaving in some additional lore into the existing architecture. I think that took a lot of skill to do, and I commend her for that. Um, the other part of this book, and a large part of it, focuses on the breakdown of the UNSC soldiers, both the ODSTs and the Spartans, and additionally, some of the civilians that were on board the UNSC Infinity. Now, when I mean civilian, clearly it was a warship. It wasn't like you had chefs and barbers or anything hanging out on a warship, but you had people that were not really acclimated to war, people who were more reserved for medicine or psychology or logistics rather than meant for fighting. So all of these survivors, at least the group that we follow, uh, they're called the people in the, they, they were called like the boaters. They were in a, they were in a life boat that crashed down together 
you follow their story. And there's about six or seven of them. There's a couple Spartans thrown in there as well, some ODSTs and some other non-military personnel who um, had to try to survive. And it's interesting as a sort of coming of age story to see some of the people who aren't really most adept at fighting learn how to fight. It was also interesting to see the most elite ODSTs and Spartans losing their tactical advantage as their gear begins to break down. One of the really cool things in Halo Infinite Season 2 was the inception of this lone wolf theme. The idea that Spartans are out in the field for an exceptionally long time without the ability to return to get their armor properly fitted and readdressed and re-geared up. And they begin to scavenge off the land and make makeshift weaponry and make makeshift armor to survive. You see a lot of that in this book and it gives me much more appreciation for this theme. You have Spartans who are breaking down mentally and physically. Their armor is failing them. Their AIs are failing them. The technology that they use, in addition to their superior physical prowess and military training, is taken away. And it becomes a much more of a guerrilla warfare. And that's actually what the idea of the Rubicon Protocol is. And it, once that point is reinforced about halfway through the book, you really start to understand just how gritty and rough this environment was for the soldiers who were trying to survive on an island, you know, in the middle of this halo ring, um, basically as the banished close in around them and begin to close ranks and systematically wipe them out. And it was written very, very well. Um, the book takes place in, in time jumps um, leading up to ultimately the chief waking up, although that is not actually mentioned in the book. The timelines line up pretty well with like, and so-and-so did this. And then you know that like the chief was like just waking up as that started. So this fills in that gap. This book also deals a lot with um, torture and a lot of very gory violence. Something that I have not seen in a Halo book really ever that I can think of outside of the occasional mention of a grunt being blown apart or a jackal blown apart. You get a lot of that, you know, the ammo ripped through their armor and sheared their spine or the grenade exploded, the methane exploded and destroyed a bunch of them. This is the first time you read about that, but it's of the UNSC soldiers dying. People getting their spines broken and their arms broken and explosions and losing limbs and dying and how it feels to die and the mental breakdown of the, the horrors of war catching up with them. And it, it has a very dark tone to it, which I really appreciated. It was something unexpected, but honestly, considering where this takes place in the Halo timeline and considering how relentless the banished are, basically the most violent evil threat the UNSC has ever faced, you kind of get a good sense for that. And I, I wish, honestly that some of the previous Halo books dealing with the Flood were written with this level of realism because I think it would give players a much better appreciation of what they're going against. This book absolutely reinforces the idea that Master Chief is the ultimate soldier because you go down in Halo Infinite and you clean house. That's the whole point of the game. You re rebuilding the footholds and the Ford operating bases and building up the army and pushing the banished back into their hole, essentially. Here, you're dealing with, in this book, you're dealing with three or four Spartans who are struggling to survive, who are not able to eat food or drink water, who grow delirious, who grow weak, who grow tired, who constantly are losing tactical military advantages that they once had. It's a very different look on what the UNSC actually went through in those early days, and I really liked it for that. In closing, I want to say that the book does feel rushed at the end. And I know at the beginning of this video, I mentioned the book was delayed twice. I'm not really sure why. It seems to me that there were about 35 of the 38 chapters that were written, which were very in-depth and detailed and really good, solid read. Then at the end of the book, the last few chapters, it seems very rushed. Characters who are scattered across the the magnitude of the ring who have been scattered uh, separately for over 150, 160 days miraculously meet up together. Villains who are introduced find an untimely demise or success in the remaining few pages of the book. And it's a little bit of a letdown. One of the coolest parts of this book 
is the union between a Spartan and a brute warrior who have to team up together in order to survive. It's very interesting. It's kind of like that play on Halo 3 with the Master Chief and the Arbiter, but in this case, it's a little more life or limb. They're on a part of the ring that's actually being jettisoned into outer space, and they have to work together to survive. And they hate each other. They are at each other's throats, but they also somehow respect each other to agree to kind of like stop fighting to progress. And their story was by far to me the most interesting part of this book. And of course, I'm not going to give away what happens, but the resolution seemed a little weak. I feel like the characters involved in that story deserved better. And that's why I said I'm confused as to why this book was delayed so many times when it seems like there would have been time to polish and beef up that story. I wish we had a little bit more there. But that minor gripe aside, I think the story is told very well, and I really appreciate Kelly Gay's ability to take something and make it so menacing and evil. After reading this book, I want to replay the campaign and absolutely destroy every brute because of the horrors they inflict on some of the coolest characters I think we've been introduced to in a long time. Spartans with major characteristics and flaws and personality traits that don't make them the best. And people who rise up in the challenges of these you know, UNSC military and non-military members who rise up and learn how to fight and defend themselves with makeshift weapons and guerrilla tactics. I want to see more of that in this universe. And I hope that this book sells well. Part of the reason I'm doing this review is to promote it, but also to say, hey, look, we appreciate a darker edge. This is not a pleasant time. This isn't the time where two or three Spartans come down and completely clean house and it's a miraculous show of force and the traditional Mary Jane stories that we've gotten in the past. This is a very different, gritty, gory version of Halo and one that I absolutely appreciated. So if you're looking for something to read, check it out, the Halo Rubicon Protocol. I highly recommend it. I'm looking at the wiki here. It actually just came out August 9th, so not very many days ago. But do yourself a favor. If you're a fan of Halo, if you're a fan of Halo Infinite, I think you owe it to yourself to check this one out. That's it for today's video review. Thank you guys so much for watching. Take care of yourselves. And until next time, I will see you guys on the other side.